Joab. Joy. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Burning Issue for America 2022, a webinar panel program sponsored by Hawaii Pacific University. I'm Tim Apicella, your host for the 60 minute discussion. 2021 was a time of confusing and confounding issues and events. These are likely to continue to perplex us in 2022 and to affect the future of our country going forward. Today, we look at five of the most troublesome of these issues with our five blue ribbon panelists. John Waihe, former governor and community leader, will examine the changes reflected and set in motion by the January 6th insurrection. Neil Milner, former political science professor from the University of Hawaii Manoa, will address the changes and threaten our democracy. Louise Ng, attorney, community leader, and Denton's partner, will help us understand the changes that are affecting the social order of our country. Rupmani Kanadar, author and executive director of Global Relations Forum, will cover the changes that have emerged from the pandemic. John David N, history professor at Hawaii Pacific University, will analyze the historical and philosophical changes in our national perspective. In our discussion today, we will try hard to connect the dots, to make sense of these troublesome issues and events, and to learn how they affect and exacerbate each other. We want to separate the critical issues that are changing our world from the less important distractions we are subject subjected to in these difficult times. Click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to our panelists. Keep your chat box open to see other attendees and what they're saying. And if you want, closed captions, just click the CC button on the bottom of your screen. And now to our first topic, an examination of the challenges reflected and set in motion by the insurrection with former Governor John Waihe. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, aloha. Aloha. Go ahead, you have the floor. Well, you know, it was my privilege that uh, about a few days, just a few days after the uh, insurrection to actually interview uh, all the members of our congressional delegation, uh, all, both senators and, uh, and the members of the, uh, the House. And there's no doubt in my mind as, you, as they describe the events that were actually happening uh, that, that happened as they happened, um, that there was real fear there, that there was an idea that uh, something horrible was happening to our government that had never been happened, that never happened before, and that the insurrection was real. And, and by the way, they made very clear that, the, um, that their feelings were shared by, by colleagues on both sides of the house, that Republican colleagues are feeling the same way, Democratic colleagues are also reacting. And then when, when you got in, you know, followed up in the news as to uh, how these things, are, the aftermath was unfolding, there were uh, all these stories coming out like uh, the Republican speaker calling Trump and begging uh, the president to do something about uh, what was happening at the state capitol. Um, the timing, everything. It looked like we had a nonpartisan moment when people would say in America, uh, hey, look, it's been fun, but enough is enough. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's get serious about what is serious. And it was a very serious uh, event. And yet, as time went on, it became very, it's become very clear that the, um, that the whole event is becoming a, something more like a political milestone. And that the former president has actually been very uh, able to, to, to use it, not as a, an indictment, but as a, um, see, I told you so, you know, these guys are picking on me kind of response. So in terms of what they, the, what's going on now may mean to America, um, you know, there, there are really two parts to it. I mean, and, and it's the most depressing subject for me anyway. Uh, 
in, in this sense that there's a kind of a policy emphasis where, where we, we actually have people looking into the merits of everything. And there's a political, uh, there's a political aspect to all of this. And, 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 and let me put it this way, that if Trump was a Democrat and the Republicans were in charge of, uh, of um, studying the insurrection, my opinion would be that there might be <laughs> some uh, actual prosecution of the whole thing. I mean, it, it would get there. But unfortunately, Democrats are so interested in being correct that the politics of this may play out so that nothing will ever be, uh, nothing will happen. Because it all depends on who, I don't know if I'm making this point very clear, but it all depends on who wins the next election. If the Republicans take the majority of the uh, leadership in the House of Representatives, my opinion is this will just, be um, moved aside, and all of this content that would have been dug up and neatly packaged, um, uh, you know, would just be started to be swept at least out of Congress. And I think that they, I don't know a president who was more worthy of being in, in, uh, impeached than Trump, and yet we could never get beyond the partisan line. So uh, this is, the insurrection really is a part, of, a bigger part of America. And the current president actually really knows how to turn all of this mess into his, his benefit. I mean, his recent speech where he's promising to pardon everybody who not only participated in what happened on Jan January 6th, but what may happen in the future if the, and this is really critical. I mean, this to me was the most uh, depressing statement that he made. Uh, if, uh, if he is in the future prosecuted in any of the urban areas that he mentioned by racist, racist, pros politically motivated prosecutors, and, uh, and, and also with this racist House uh, Committee, in all of which are, uh, what well, most of which are headed by uh, African-American uh, leaders. And so here we, you know, what, what do you do when you have a call like that? I mean, we're, how, how much crazier does this have to get? So in terms of what the implication is for America, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't yeah. know. Because Let me I focus in on that point, John. Let me focus in on that point because it's a good one. You mentioned this very important, you know, uh, rally he had in Texas and the fact that he was going to, he stated explicitly he was going to pardon all those that were convicted in the January 6th insurrection. Um, then he, to, to your point about the prosecutors, you know, being focused upon for protests in the future, does this give his base more incentive to act violently at future events? Absolutely. Uh, you know, what, what, he, what he has learned is what every Tim, Tim Horn, you know, I, I guess the, 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 what Trump is doing, in my opinion, politically, is doing what we grew up being taught would be unthinkable. It would be unthinkable to even think the kinds of things that, uh, uh, think up the kinds of things that he is doing uh, in, in America. I mean, it's just not done. And therefore, nobody did it. And yet, every Ten Horn uh, dictator all over the world, in many times in history, uh, used the same kind of tactics to avoid prosecution, to uh, you know, un to, to keep themselves in office and, and the rest. So what he is doing is he is appealing to, for example, when you call the uh, the chairman of the uh, uh, of the Senate Select Committee investigating you for uh, investigating January six uh, as a, as his actions as racist. Who is he being racist to? You know, and, and for the first time, you, you're having people playing to the ultra, uh, ultra right wing base of the American public and, and, and thinking it's comfortable. But what you're really doing is you're trying to avoid prosecution by political means. 
using the institutions of politics to avoid prosecution because it's like when he called uh, everything Trump does, he does publicly. And so all of a sudden, I mean, okay, it's not that bad. It's not really a crime. It's not really a sin. It doesn't feel like it because why would it? He's talking about it. He's admitting it. You know, I'm going to pardon everybody before I pardon everybody. He used to That was done uh, in, in a sixth grade uh, six, well, I don't know if we teach civics in sixth grade anymore, but but if we teach civics in a class, uh, you, you say that's obstruction of justice. You don't go and tell the jury or tell people or tell the witnesses that, hey, if you don't prosecute, you know, you don't testify against me, I'll make sure you get away with it as soon as I'm reelected. It's just not done. You know, John, I. I'm going to assume that you uh, remember the 60s and 70s. Um, well, you're old well, enough to, to live the 60s and 70s. Um, do you draw any parallels or do you see any parallels between the, the conflict and the, all the problems we had in the late 68 to 71-year uh, period to where we are today? Uh, remember the weathermen, they were blowing up buildings almost every day. Um, do you see any parallels between that group and, say, the Proud Boys or uh, the Oath Keepers? And do you, what do you think about that? Well, I used to see parallels. I mean, they obviously were. They, you know, the Proud Boys and the Minutemen and all of that were maybe different expressions of, of the political uh, continuum. What's different is when you see those groups being supported in, in, in a political fashion. Uh, first of all, by the, the symbol of one of our, uh, of our parties. By the way, the party that was probably most likely to have prosecuted uh, the, the left, uh, the left uh, dissident groups of the past. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, this becomes not so much, doesn't resemble in my mind uh, the, the 60s and the 70s as much, which we, you know, we, we used to have uh, Ku Klux Klan's match, marching through uh, towns and villages. I mean, those things are defensible, actually. But what we see now is something more akin to the brown shirts that, that appeared in Germany in, in the 1930s, in, in my opinion, and, 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 uh, and people going along with it. It's amazing to me, and, and I think the difference is this. It, it, the, 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 the Democratic Party that's supposed to fix these things sometimes get caught up in their own self-righteousness. And they're more important about making sure the, T, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted than going after and ending something that may be evil. I don't think the Republicans have any, I'm not calling them evil, but I don't think they have any compunction about dotting I's and crossing T's. What they have is a belief that their side is right. And therefore, whatever it takes to get that right established, that culture established, is, is worth doing. I mean, when, when the, before the last election, the, the Republicans took 27 days to confirm a new Supreme Court justice, just like that, before the election. Our, our and I love them, I mean, they get, Dubin, uh, you know, is, is, uh, the, the judiciary chairman for the Senate is saying, no, we're going to take our time. We're going to make sure Republicans are being, you know, giving them a chance. We're going to be nonpartisan. Yeah, yeah. maybe. And maybe yeah. we should. And maybe we'll get it done. But we also maybe missed the deadline. And if we lost the election, I don't even mean the presidency. I mean, you know, in the Senate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We, we do have the same thing happen to us that happened in Obama. So when you look at the country, you know, the groups that use totalitarian tactics to overthrow governments historically were not the majority groups. There were groups yeah. that knew how to take advantage of government institutions and uh, flip themselves into power. Okay. Well, all great points. Thank you, John, for, for bringing that to the table and for our panelists to uh, think about and further discuss. Thank you. Uh, going now to our democracy, uh, we have Neil Milner. Neil, you have the floor. Thank you. Let me start by saying this. Right now, I can much more easily imagine 
a civil war in this country than I can imagine any other way that we're going to move forward. I'm not saying that with uh, relief. I'm not saying that with pleasure, obviously. I'm saying that in the sense of that's the most likely thing to happen. And the way that I go about looking at this is to try to look a little bit beyond the specific activities of the day. Specifically, I look at what kind of evidence is there about our situation that really shows how close we are to losing democracy and moving toward a civil war. And there are two really interesting things that I've come across very recently done by researchers who have been at this for a long time. One is a piece that says we're at a tipping point. On the basis of all kinds of data, we're at a tipping point. What that means is that this is a very unique time in our history. It is a time at which we've come to a point where issues, crises don't unite us. They make it worse for us. Um, the people who did this research said the tipping point is moved in that direction. Republicans moved there first, but everybody is moving in that direction. So that they use as an example would be COVID. Most crises of that proportion in this country, you can think about 9-11, united us. COVID is an example of separating us. Barbara Walters, Barbara Walter, not Barbara Walters, an expert on democracy and civil war is part of a group that has for years been studying a, not, a large number of countries over a long period of time to see what is it that makes democracy unstable and that leads to civil war. And it's a very interesting finding. They say that the least democratic countries are most are are the are not the most likely to have a civil war. Not the most democratic countries, but what they call anocracy. An anocracy is a kind of democratic process that's quasi democratic. It's weakened. And she said, if that is the most important thing that predicts whether or not there's going to be a civil war, and in fact. All of the information suggests that we've moved from being this country, from being on the high democratic side into anocracy. And so we find ourselves in a position where for all kinds of reasons, we are much more weakening than we are before. You can talk about Trump, you can talk about other things, but the process has been a longer developing kind of process. What's the main cause of it? Polarization, if you pick out one factor that shows up, uh, Walter talks about a kind, of, um, a kind of factionalization that happens. We have the polarization for sure. We have a kind of polarization in this country right now in which everything important is defined by whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, everything, your lifestyle, who you want your kids to associate with when they, when they are thinking about getting married, um, all of these sorts of things, how you worship, where you worship, if you worship, that's what life has become. And it's become a kind of a way where we no longer trust the other side. John used the word evil before. We use the word evil to describe our opposition. And so there is a lack of trust. There is a lack of, of so on. It's, a, it's an extreme kind of polarization. So you have, you have differences you have uh, significant differences, you have elements of race. What Walter suggests is that what's very important in, civil, in the movement towards civil war are uh, some various kinds of things. One of the things she calls is an ethnic entrepreneur. That is someone who will, someone who will kind of light the fire to create ethnic differences. Trump is an ethnic entrepreneur, whites versus everybody else. That's one thing. A second thing is militias and the possibilities of violence. Well, let's talk about let's talk about the possibilities of violence now. The, the recent polls all show the same thing, that a significant minority of people in the United States are, are willing to think about using violence uh, if they don't like what the government is doing. 
it's pretty much the same percentage of Democrats as, as it is Republicans. You also have in this country, you've had for a long period of time, a well-organized militia movement that's becoming even more well-organized. That's part of what you saw, just part. I'm gonna to get to the rest of it in the insurrection of January 6th. Uh, and of course you have a very polarization on, on, on whether the insurrection was even an insurrection just as you have a polarization on whether people should be able to vote easily. You have the presence of these militias. You have, along with this kind of presence of militias, ones that have already used violence, that have attested to use violence. So the conclusion that she comes to and that the others come to is that there, there is a very good chance that you will have a civil war in this country. It's not going to be the blues versus the grays. It's not going to be a half million men on one side versus a half million on the other. There's going to be guerrilla warfare. Now remember, this person is, is not writing from her emotion. She's writing from good data, as are the others who have this, this kind of experience to talk about it. So that's essentially where we are right now, a country that is really on the edge of moving in that in that direction. You want me to be optimistic? Mm. Uh, but yeah. I can say, OK, here, can I give you, do I have time, Tim, or? or... Uh, yeah, very quickly. And then I, I, I want to ask you a question. Right. Sure. Three things. None of them is easy. They require a whole different way of, of thinking about ourselves, one of which is powerful law enforcement that and the political institutions that can put down attempts at insurrection and it's a war. That's an open question for all kinds of complicated constitutional reasons and also because our political institutions aren't operating that well. We'll see. We'll see how that comes out. A second one is that in effect you have to change how you think about politics. You have to understand that if rebuilding and trust and a depolarization is going to occur, it's going to occur at the local level and moving itself up. That may sound my students' favorite slam word, idealistic, but look at the national institutions. The final one is that you have to begin to think about our conflict, not as a political conflict in the standard sense, but as an intractable conflict. Intractable sounds like a, a, a pessimistic word, and it is. Uh, but I'll say just quickly what optimism is about it. Intractical means you have to think about the situation in the United States the way you thought about the situation in Northern Ireland, or the way you think about significant religious conflicts in other countries, or the way you think about Israelis and Palestinians. Now, that's very hard to do. Very hard to think along those lines. There are people who do intractable political conflict work with some success. There's a whole group of them around the country. But the first thing that people have to do, for the most part, is to start posturing themselves and picturing this country not as a unique democracy that knows how to settle itself uh, in the usual kind of political sort of way, but as a country that has moved away from democracy in important sorts of ways, and that may not be able, probably isn't going to be able to recover on the basis of standard things like elections or who controls the Senate, or whether Joe Biden is a good bridge builder, and so on. All right. You know, while you're on this topic, you know, the filibuster for decades has paralyzed Congress, has gridlocked Congress. To what degree does this gridlock and the continuation of Congress's inability to get anything meaningfully done for the population, um, to what degree does that add fuel to the fire for those who say that democracy has seen its best of days? Nothing's getting done or under a democracy. Uh, to the base of Trump, does that further incite them to try to overthrow our democracy? Well, I think that there's two things going on there. The base of Trump is the base of Trump. Now, remember, Trump's base, for the most part, are people like you and me. The people who participated in, in the insurrection of January 6th, there was a small group of well-organized people, the Oath Keepers and so on. The majority of people who were there 
were presumably Republicans. They were small businessmen. They tended to have jobs or, or women. They tended to have jobs. Their base is that, they, is, is that they don't trust institutions anymore. I think from the standpoint of, uh, from the broader standpoint is, if you think that the filibuster is causing this problem, then you're, you're underestimating the problem. And if you think that they had gotten the filibuster changed so that this law would have passed, as far as I'm concerned, that would have been great. But the fundamental structure of polarization and the fundamental inability for our political institutions to respond, which by the way, is one of the things that gets democracies into trouble because people, not just those overtly against it, but people who become fearful and, and worry about whether the institutions can protect them, that's, that's where we're going now. All right. Thank you very much for your perspectives. And now to discussion about our society. Louise Ng. Good morning. Thank, good morning. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for Think Tech Hawaii for this invitation. And I have to say that I'm going to be just, I, I was depressed coming in. I'm going to be just depre as depressing on the social aspect because what we're seeing in politics, uh, we're seeing in society as well. And that is increased polarization, increased intolerance, um, and, uh, you know, and it's not just the U.S. I think it's global. I mean, we're seeing religious intolerance and human rights violations, not just in the U.S., but, but all around the world, um, and democratic institutions being threatened. I mean, it's all tied together. And, you know, what we're seeing here in the, in the country that really upsets me is just the cultural and racial anxieties that are driving people apart. Um, you know, the, the, that's really kind of, you know, for it's sort of calculated and shown in many ways. I mean, we're seeing a calculated perpetuation of the big lie by GOP leaders um, and a great majority of their voters. And as uh, uh, Governor Wahei mentioned, the Trump saying publicly, um, you know, that he essentially supports insurrectionists. Um, we're seeing that in the assault on voting rights and fair elections. Um, gerrymandering and issues that are going to hurt minority communities, um, you know, battles in school boards about what is going to be taught, uh, the double-edged sword of technology, which is being used to, um, you know, just sort of foment um, extreme views where we really should be using it as a, you know, to break the digital divide. It can be a a, a how you know used for the power of good in education, but instead it's being used to divide people. Um, we're you know we're seeing the politicization of public health issues, COVID nineteen vaccinations, testing, um, even the whole issue of reproductive freedom is is back and and in danger. Um, all of which, as we're seeing, can lead to civil violence, breakdown of society. Um, as Neil mentioned, we're seeing increased po polls that, you know, uh, of, and studies of increased fears of success, secession, as well as civil war. And, uh, you know, that's what keeps me up at night. I, I hope that there are ways that we can break through that. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, and I, I agree, I think, with, with Neil, that I think it's going to have to start at the local level, and we're talking local, you know, to try to fix these things, it's going to be individual communities, local communities, local government, um, and people coming together despite um, the ugly talk to try to reach common ground and um, have a more civil discourse. I guess that's the big picture. Um, but Tim, what are, what are your thoughts? What did you want to ask me? Well, you know, um... Neil mentioned that racism, like no other president, he, uh, Trump has been successful of using that as a wedge issue. And I guess my question is, to what extent has white fear, if you will, white fear and, and the fear of, of being replaced, uh, you know, the old mantra from the white supremacist groups for decades and if not 100 years, how has that entered into our politics today and, and polarized this nation? Well, Tim, I, I would say that's front and center. Thank you. I was going to get to that because it, to me, and I've heard this, I've heard commentators mention that. I mean, that's our original sin. And that's not just the country's original sin. That is original sin of colonialism and Western democracy. Much as I, I love 
you know, I'm happy to, I, I love being here. I'm glad my parents, my great grandparents immigrated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we need to reckon with that. And the problem is that some people are denying that and they're, they're afraid of, of you know, the, the old order being overcome. And I recently, you know, two things that I've got that I'm listening to on Audible and I think we're really illustrative is one is The Warmth of Other Suns, um, which talks about the great um, black migration and talks about what people were escaping from in the South. Um, which is really horrifying, but we need to deal with that. We need to open our eyes and people need to be educated. We can't cut that out of the education system. Um, the other thing that I just listened to recently was an audible um, of Joe Walsh. He has a, a talk show called White Flag and he interviewed Wajahat uh, Ali, who is an author of a recent book, no, um, Go Back to Where You Came From, and which I heard about on, a on NPR. And he talks about the fact that, you know, we need to, we need to come to terms of the fact that uh, this needs to be a multi, you know, what we need to aspire to is a multicultural society. And that ties into the need in our workplaces and in our communities to support diversity, inclusion, and equity. I mean, as, as you know, we're seeing all these ugly trends, but there's some good trends going on that good people need to get behind. Um, diversity, inclusion, equity, multiculturalism, appreciating the multiculturalism of our country um, and not feeling that that's a threat, but it's a way to celebrate everybody. And I want to see that also happen in education too. We're not, we shouldn't just talk about ethnic studies. That should be part of the American narrative, the American history um, that's being taught. So, all right. Um, that's we that's have my a, story. <laughs> thank you. We have a question uh, from one of our, um, our, our viewers here, and that is the following. Is there a tipping point by which local government can't do anything? Uh, how do guns and gun owners figure into the possibility of, of that tipping point? Well, that is, the, that is a concern. I mean, we are seeing people turn to violence. We've, that's always been an undercurrent in our country. It's not, it's not new for 2021 and 2022. Um, we've not been able to stop mass shootings. Um, uh, so, you know, we've got the individuals who are, are sick, but then we also have people who are talking, you, you know, we, we saw that with the insurrection, with threats of violence. Um, we need to, and I don't know how, that, that's another intractable problem that we need to deal with, but we need to fix the way people use guns, not as a way to get out their, you know, to get out at other people. It, it's really going from, you know, we're not using them as protection. We're using them as, as uh, tools of insurrection and overthrow and getting out people's frustrations. Um, and we need to put those guns down really and talk about, again, civil discourse, civil education, civics education. We need to get that back into the way we educate kids. Critical race theory is not even an issue, but let's get back to teaching kids and adults what the basis for our democracy are. Guns are not supposed to be there to affect social change. Do you, Louise, do you think that our younger generation has an opportunity to, to step up to the plate, so to speak, to make a difference in this, what seems a, a, a conflict that right now seems unsolvable? Uh, do they step up in our society and what would it take for them to do so? I, they definitely need to step up. I think that, um, it, you know, it has been said that a lot of this anxiety and the fear of replacement is from older white people who will die off soon. Is that true? I don't know. I think we still have to think about our next generation. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, our next generation who are being raised in a much more multicultural society, who are more willing to accept gender differences, gender orientation differences, um, being around kids of different races and cultures. And that's what we need to encourage and celebrate. Um, but we can't forget to educate them as well on what makes this democracy strong. But I, I would say that maybe I'm just talking to all the kids that I agree with, but many of them, um, you know, realized early, I, I saw this in my, my own kids of wanting, realizing early on in the, the national debates, my, you know, apolitical kids realizing that 
Trump is just give a lot of, you know, talking a lot of hogwash. But un unfortunately, people were buying into that. I'm also seeing kids want to um, help um, uh, further diversity and inclusion. And, you know, just seeing why, what are people, why are people even concerned about gender differences and gender orientation uh, stereotypes and the like. So yes, I think we need to look to our new gener younger generation, encourage them to get engaged, run for office, vote um, as a way of trying to get past what are very depressing um, issues and situations right now. All righty. One last quick question. Uh, it's a tough one from one of our, our viewers, and that is, how do we, how do we as, a, as a nation, conceptually get beyond our tribalism? I think that's, all my, yeah, the big, good question, because I think tribalism is almost a human nature and reaction. And we see that in the way Democrats and Republicans, for instance, use the same language to vilify the other side. Um, I mean, I think it's outrageous that Trump is using the term racist uh, to you know, justify what, in my view, are very racist things that he has done. Um, and so how do we get beyond tribalism? I saw there was an interesting, I, somehow for, this foreign policy magazine started popping up in my email. Um, and re at the beginning of the year, they had uh, maybe 10 commentators talk about how you save democracy. And one suggestion was you need to break down barriers societally, which is that people need to live together, work together, go to school together, be able to talk. Um, you know, and I think in Hawaii, we have kind of a, maybe a Petri dish here where we can, um, you know, use our closeness and the fact that we have family and we know people on opposite sides of the aisle that, you know, but there are aunties and cousins and we can talk to them to try to heal that tribalism, try to understand where the other side is coming from, see if there's common ground. And if there's not, we just try to do our best to bring along enough people um, to, you know, that agree that we just need to make our society better and overcome differences. Kind of Tim, there's the optimism, the there's the optimism we were looking for for this program. Thank you. <laughs> Tim, can I, Tim, can I add one? Go ahead, Neil. Go that? ahead. Okay. Question. If you're, if the first thing you have to do to get rid of polarization is to admit that your tribal, tribalism is to admit you're a tribe. You yeah. know, when, when this group here, when we're talking about tribalism, there's a kind of, up to now, an implicit notion that tribalism is because the Republicans are tribes. You're a tribe. We've become tribes. We talk. I'm not saying everybody, I mean, I know what side, I know what side I think is right, but that's not the point. If you want to get rid of tribalism or polarization, you have to realize that the that you're undoubtedly part of one of the polarized groups. If you want to argue that you want to impose or get certain kind of policies, that's different. But if you want to get rid of polarization, you have to participate in the process of getting rid of polarization, at which we're not very good right now. But it certainly doesn't involve just saying those people are evil because they're saying the same thing back to you. Good point, Neil. Yeah, Thank I think you. We, yeah, we need to just understand that yeah, we all have our biases and we need to get beyond that. We, need to, we all need to deal with that and be uncomfortable about that. All right. Thank you so much, Luis and Neil. Thank you very much. And to our viewers that have uh, presented these questions, thank you. Uh, moving along to the pandemic, uh, we have Rupmati. Rupmati, you have the floor. Hi. Aloha, Tim, and to the other panelists also. Um, now, um, I want to talk about, uh, when we say my pandemic, it gives a feeling that uh, the impact and spread of this pandemic was uh, has occurred at such an unprecedented pace because we live in a highly interconnected, interdependent global village. And the economic, political, social systems that went into a shutdown because of the unnatural number of deaths, countries had to just implode because of the populations being arguably introduced to the concept of a pandemic. You know, it is the third year that we are running into this pandemic and the devastation that the pandemic has brought. It's around 900,000 deaths that have occurred. And still we have a huge... Uh, uh, portion of the population that denies the pandemic. They, they still say that, um, you know, they refuse COVID protocols, they refuse the viability of the vaccinations. 
and in the process they become super spreaders or they become victims so as uh, this dangerous brew of people like jay says calls them it makes it difficult for governments to control them to function and to effect to provide effective uh, relief to this pandemic because uh, irrespective of the uh, models of governance this pandemic is going to be a leveler it's going to hurt you whether you're a republican whether you're a democrat whether you're atheist whether you're you know anything it is not going to see what is your uh, identity it is just going to affect you so uh, in uh, in a democratic uh, form of governance we find it more difficult to control uh, the pandemic because of the fundamental rights the issues of uh, uh, my right my uh, my uh, my zone my space and i will I, i will not believe in the vaccine and it's okay for me not to come into the community and maybe i will not uh, you know i will not participate in this so the governments uh, find it difficult whether it's trump whether it's biden now uh, america needs an effective and robust healthcare system we need uh, which is financially they have to uh, it has to be uh, diverted towards preventive uh, care for the pandemic you know it's a unknown territory that this pandemic has brought about Uh, really nobody knows how the vaccine is going to mutate or you know a study into the genome sequence of the uh, uh, what do you call it of the pathogen is not going to give us uh, an insight of how it's going to predict how it's going to behave so we have to make sure that we uh, follow the government's instructions now if we go to see uh, forms of governance in which there is democracy is restricted have been arguably more successful in controlling the pandemic so uh, that's a point to debate about whether uh, you require force to uh, make people understand the viability and of the threat of the pandemic it is not a easy place to be in because it's been raging for 3 years it can go on for infinite numbers because right. it's a mutating virus correct it's if it was a um, a zoonotic virus we could have uh, it would have faded away but it you know, is mutating um, and we don't yeah well one of our one of our um, viewers has asked this question and i'm i'm curious to get your answer on this to what degree has governor ege um effectively addressed this in in the state of hawaii in your opinion uh see hawaii hawaii becomes uh, um it is the safest right as the safest state during covid-19 so it does say a lot that hawaii has effectively controlled the pandemic situation as compared to the other states we are we have a 19th uh, position on the positive testing rate we have the fourth lowest death rate and we have the second highest vaccination rate that is around 74.8 or 75% so uh, that itself is uh, ample evidence that our governor is doing good things for this if he had not been uh, in a position to give these figures we would have had one of the highest rates but um, you know he's got the advantage of being isolated the island it helps and uh, the vaccination has been highest now he has to just concentrate on the tourism uh, industry so that we have the income coming back because in the all over the world the pandemic has struck uh, people financially more than uh, you know the death yeah. rate is even all over but financially it's hurting and hawaii because it depends on tourism we need our tourist industry to be back to normal you know that is giving incentives to travel that is showing that you can uh, follow covid protocols and come to hawaii Yeah. So that, All right. Well, that, good points and thank you very much for your perspective on the pandemic and how it affects not only here our society in Hawaii but our nation as a whole. Uh thank you. Yes. Uh to wrap things up or to round things out, we have uh John uh, uh, would you please take care of this and um wrap yeah. wrap it up. Sure. Right. So Uh, let me zoom out a little bit and uh, you know it's dark man I'm, I'm feeling a lot of darkness here and uh, I'm not sure it's that dark but it certainly is complex and deep in American history deep in American political culture so let me just outline some work I've been doing on my 
uh, on a, a book project that I'm working on that I call Liberty Battles. And I call it Liberty Battles because I see two different definitions of liberty in that, that are at play right now. And that have actually been at play in American political culture for a long time. The first one is the uh, civil rights concept of, of liberty, which we're all familiar with, right? The, the abolitionist freedom from slavery, uh, the, the 14th Amendment, uh, the civil rights movement in the, in the 1960s, and then, of course, uh, the current day civil rights movements that are fighting for more rights for, for disabled people and LGBTQ people and, and all of the rest of this. So the other side, so we understand that well, the other side of this, uh, I don't think this, this second definition of liberty, I don't think we really understand at all. And this is a much older uh, concept of liberty that comes out of, it, it goes way beyond the American Revolution back to Machiavelli. And of course, Machiavelli, we know for, you know, writing uh, The Prince and, uh, you know, the ends justify the means, but he actually wrote a lot on liberty and, and republics. And his concept of liberty can be characterized through what he wrote as what he called vivere libero, which is translated as to live freely. Essentially, what he meant was to live freely without outside interference. And this, of course, was very appropriate to his time, but it's also appropriate to our time as well. Uh, Machiavelli was involved in the Florentine Republic, which was under pressure from outside uh, forces throughout his career as a diplomat. Uh, but his ideas then made their way into Europe uh, generally, and then uh, crossed the Atlantic in the 18th century, became a part of the American rebellion, actually, which led to the American Revolution. And, and at, at that point, uh, uh, the American colonists became afraid that the British crown was going to steal away their liberty to, to prevent them from living freely, just like, like Machiavelli feared outsiders would destroy the Florentine Republic. Now, so when we think about the American Revolution, we actually have to think about this kind of liberty, which is darker, more fearful, and more reactive than the other, the civil rights kind of liberty. Uh, when, when, so when this happened, in the, so this actually drove the American Revolution, not the civil rights form of liberty, which was really not on the table uh, during the American Revolution very much. It was a very beginning of, of those kinds of concepts. So it, when we look into the 19th century, this, this form of liberty, this, this dark, uh, you know, kind of reactive form of liberty, this fearful form of liberty, gets fused with racism in the question of whether or not you give political rights to African Americans in the Northern states, where you have lots of free blacks, but should you actually give them the right to vote? And when you read what commentators say about this and making these decisions, political leaders, what they say is, these people are going to destroy our liberty. They're going to take away, they're going to degrade our liberty and destroy the Republic. And therefore we cannot allow them uh, uh, political rights. So, so in this way that this darker kind of Machiavellian version of liberty became embedded in, in uh, American political culture and has done battle, liberty battle, has done battle with the civil rights version of liber liberty ever since that time. Uh, if, if, let's pull it quickly forward to the present day. And when we look at issues like the birther movement, uh, like counter protesters who, who expressed fear about Black Lives Matter and the, the George Floyd protests. And then of course, in the insurrection itself, it, it's what we see in the, in the language, the symbols and the concepts behind these movements very much matches uh, uh, this appeals to the American Revolution, uh, appeals to freedom, appeals to liberty. And so these movements actually have a progenitor. They have, they've inherited political language and concepts from something which is very old in our, in our history. So, um, so, uh, so this darker form of liberty, now, it sh should be noted that uh, in the history of our country, this darker form of liberty has uh, never won permanently. One could argue that uh, you, can, you can see this in the, uh, the American Civil War, uh, in the secessionist movements, their, their claims to, uh, to the generation of 1776 and the American rebels and, and American protests, the 
Tea Party protests and the rest of this are echoes of this of this darker form of liberty. The one thing about this darker form of liberty is it seeks to protect the political co community from outsiders. And so I think that's how uh, conservative and kind of these radical uh, protesters that uh, that we see uh, one, what, what they're trying to do, what they see themselves as doing is protecting American liberty from outsiders who threaten it. And it, 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 so in the long train of history, it matches uh, the Machiavellian uh, concept of, of vivere libero. Uh, it's not to say that this, uh, these two concepts of liberty are mutually exclusive. They can be held within the same communities and even, I think, by the same well, people. John, let, let me hit that point because um, you're saying that they're protecting their, you know, the liberty from outside influences. Right. Hasn't that always been the case with the, uh, the know-nothings? And uh, hasn't that been the case with all immigration issues is not just protecting the liberty, but really trying to keep uh, racism, uh, you know, the races at bay? Right. So, yes. And I think that's a that's a good example. I mean, even you, you can even look at the populist movement of the 1890s. Uh, these are movements which characterize themselves as protecting the American Republic, as protecting American liberty. And they were actually, you know, they were quite racist and, and exclusionary. So I think we're dealing with this a, another moment in this uh, in this kind of conceptual framework of American political culture. It, it has implications for how we think about the opposition. I mean, uh, Neil was talking about how, you know, we, we can't actually solve the problem of polarization without really understanding and maybe ex exercising some empathy for the other side. Well, if you understand the other side is making claims upon liberty, just like your side, then you might be able to develop a little more empathy for the other side, even though some of their creeds are quite noxious. Well, let me go to that. Um, yeah. How do we do that when we seem to be in a mindless cult, the cult of Trump? How do we how do we see what the other th side thinks and whether they have valid points or not? Right. So I think you start with education. I liked what Louise said about, uh, you know, civics courses. We've we've uh, kind of dropped the ball or certainly I see a lot less education about basic education about American civics. I'm not talking about patriotism courses. I'm talking about solid education about American political institutions and, and political ideas. Uh, so it, education, you know, I'm in the education field and I feel some responsibility for this. Uh, uh, so uh, education is very important. So let's put our, our resources into education and uh, let's get word out that the other side, even as it attempts to demonize our side, they're not demons, they're still Americans. Uh, and, and, you know, so I, I do think a, a better, you know, look, I'm an intellectual historian, so I think ideas are very important. And if we express the right kinds of ideas, if the, if the party in power expresses a, a kind of cherishment or, or a love of liberty, uh, that might be language that all Americans can uh, can uh, kind of gather around and, and, and kind of rally around. So um, we saw some of this in the inauguration, uh, but then of course the political divisions reappeared and, and Biden is really struggling now because of those divisions. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Governor, I see your hand up. Yeah, no, I, I did. I saw one of the, uh, one of the questions that came over, uh, you know, on the chat lines. Uh, from the from the viewers, which I, I really wanted to ask is John because I, I think it's an important issue and it's somewhat what he's talking about, and that is the equalization of uh, various events as as equally bad or equally uh, 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 you know productive. And the question was, do do you find it a little hypocritical that politicians have given so much attention to the Capitol riot, to the insurrection? Yet, when small businesses are getting looted and destroyed during the George Floyd incidents, most politicians and most people remain silent. The idea being, why aren't you treating the the looters to the with, in the same political fashion that you may be uh, treating the insurrectionists? So, how does that fit into your discussion? 
Right. Well, of course, you have to distinguish, right? I mean, <laughs> the 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 you know property damage is different from the overthrow of the American uh, Republic, uh, the American democracy, American democracy. And, and, and I guess the point is, they're two what, different, very different. Why things. do people see things as being equal when you just said right. they're different? Right. 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 Well, that's I you know uh, part of that does have to do I think with uh, with Donald Trump uh, and his whole notion of of uh, fake news and and kind of the disintegration of truths we hold uh, dear, or or at least the degradation of truths we hold dear in this country. But yeah, so that's you know that's kind of a false comparison. But um, I do think uh, the, uh, the 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 con conservative counter protesters saw a Black Lives Matter through the Machiavellian lens as every bit the deepest threat that this country faced at that moment and uh, and made appeals to uh, American founders. I mean, Jefferson, of course, Jefferson uh, participates in both concepts of liberty. Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence, which invokes unalienable rights, but Jefferson also uh, wrote about the tree of liberty being uh, nourished with the blood of patriots and tyrants. So there's a more radical, Jefferson has had so much influence on our political culture uh, and he's, he's dipped into both sides of this, this, these definitions of liberty. So, uh, and, and counter protesters, counter protesters have called in Jefferson said, look, you know, uh, we're going to, we're going to uh, nourish the tree of liberty with the blood of commies referring to the Black Lives Matter movement as communist or Marxist. All righty. You know, John, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we've come out to the end of our hour, and it goes very quickly. But uh, we can't leave until we go around the virtual table here and ask for uh, final comments or thoughts. So um, with you, John, uh, Governor, for you first, and we'll go around from there. Well, yeah. Uh, first of all, the, I really enjoyed the discussion, and I want to thank everyone for you know participating, giving us uh, the time to discuss this. But I think the the, the 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 perceptions in 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 our society when we we look at things and we give them the equal weight, uh, this question that the person brought up is a very important one. So whatever little time I get left, I'm going to pass it off to Neil. And hopefully he'll he'll have a shot at uh, giving his insight into that. So thank you. Thank you for me. Second place is to refer more to me, right? Uh, <laughs> thanks, John. Uh, look, let me say one thing first. If you're going to refer to the people on the other side as a mindless cult, you're off to a bad start. I'm not saying that I don't understand why you're calling them that. I am saying that that is a stigmatizing term that isn't going to get you anywhere, and that somehow doesn't explain the fact that if there are any Republicans living near you, your friends, your neighbors, people that work out with me at the Hawaii Kai gym, they think that way. And that means that you're creating a kind of a situation that reflects other people out there, not the people close to you. Now, that doesn't mean you have to accept them. It doesn't even mean necessarily you have to empathize with them. That's a tough word, but you have to have some sense. Let me just say one more point. I agree with the kinds of liberal agenda that Louise Ng presented, but there are two fundamental issues here, one of which is every one of those things is contested and polarized now, which means that you can't do them easily. Another thing is that liberal America doesn't really have a good way of doing these. If you think that somehow we can bring about this kind of um, uh, better emphasis on, on, on these good things, it's pretty hard. I watch my, my granddaughter go to school in Portland where there is an enormous amount of really interesting discussions among fourth graders and their teachers about gender fluidity, but it's contested. You can't just, you just can't want it to be there. Um, so that, and, and I think the Democratic Party, I, I read a lot of the uh, anti-Trump conservatives. And I think in this way, a lot of them are right because the data supports it. The Democratic Party has moved more to the left of its constituencies. It's showing up in the recent polls where Biden's numbers are abysmal. He's losing 
he's losing support among moderates. And you never, I mean, you know, the Republicans, the Republicans, the strong Republicans and the strong Democrats pretty much mail in how they think about how their presidents are going. He's losing it. Part of the reason is he's losing it is that they don't like what he's doing about uh, about the race in policing, and he doesn't like what he's doing about um, immigration, where the Democratic Party has moved to the left. They don't think he's governing effectively. You can blame it, you can say whatever you want, but you've got a conundrum, right? Especially for those of us who are left of center. If you want all this stuff, but you can't get this stuff by means that we understand conventionally, that means you have to do something else. All right, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, Luis. Well, hard to follow up on Neil because that's an intractable issue. Um, but okay, let me start. That means something, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me start at maybe at the uh, individual side because um, that's where we start, right? With how we think. And I, uh, going back to that author, Wajahat, Wajahat Ali, he had an interesting um, take on this, which is that maybe we need to be less like Daffy Duck and more like Bugs Bunny. Daffy Duck being the one who gets angry and frustrated and Bugs Bunny being the one who somehow uses humor to turn things around and get the last laugh, get the last word. Um, and I think that that go, ties into, okay, the importance of storytelling, for instance. We all need to you know, be, be able to listen and hear each other's stories to get an understanding and empathy on where people are coming from. And maybe that helps overcome divides um, I think it that I hopefully will help us get to a more uh, tolerant um, acceptance of multi that we are stronger because we are multicultural, we are different, and our differences unite us to be to use a term. Um, and I have to go back to the role of education and how we turn around the digital divide and the bad things that you know social media and digital access do to really help use that to inform people, educate people, help people go back to books and reading and critical thinking. Um, and just, again, going, you know, learning more about our system and what makes us strong and what we need to do and why we need to vote and run for office and support our institutions. All righty, thank you so much. Rupmani, your last thought. Yeah, so now to this webinar, I can give you the keywords that are to survive, adapt, and to thrive. Like we have the Delta B1, 16, 15, 17, Omicron 16, 15, 29. These are all fuzzy names, but in our, in 2022, like we have to affirm that the pandemic is just not an event. It's going to be a process that is going to engulf our individual lives, our national lives, our international realms, so we have to make sure that we are better prepared for it. There's a response uh, strategy that has to come in. There has to be a capacity building uh, for facing this pandemic. And you have to have leadership, leadership at the individual level, at the community level. And, you know, it has to come, uh, uh, it, it becomes very personal to uh, international level. So you have to make sure that you uh, span this entire spectrum without any prejudice. And, and you have to believe in your uh, leaders because they are the ones who are going to guide you at this moment, because it is absolute unknown territory that we face through this pandemic. Politics will happen, history will happen. Yes, that will happen. But this pandemic is unknown territory for all of us. We don't know how it's going to mutate next or what is going to be the next uh, genome sequence that is going to come up. So I think uh, for me, it is a very neutral and uh, without anything, without any uh, bias, we all have to face the pandemic together. Thank you Community so much. Community response to it. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Thank uh, you John, so much. you get the last word here for this program. Right, so uh, it should be noted that Machiavelli was has been proven wrong. I mean, the American Republic has lasted, you know, for over two centuries, and uh, I'm not, you know, I'm. I guess I'm not quite as uh, uh, negative or or, or or concerned as as some of the other panelists. I do think that we we need to re up our understanding of it. I, th I think very few people actually uh, have a kind of a deeper understanding of. Of, of the kind of the political uh, combat that's going on right now. Um, they get kind of a, 
a talk show kind of hot shot, you know, very quick comments, uh, you know, uh, just tiny little Twitter, Twitter comments about this, which is not very helpful. But, I, you know, like I say, I, I, the, our republic has proved to be quite durable. I mean, we survived a civil war. And as much as Neil might think that we're close to a civil war, I'm not sure that's the case. Being a historian, I'm actually teaching the civil war right now. And I think the political combat was much more fierce then. It may be 10 years from now, we might be closer to a civil war. But so I think the Republic is durable uh, and we need to find ways, find symbols, find a language uh, that can uh, that can unite people and and uh, try to resist, you know, kind of uh, Del delving into kind of our, our kind of basis, kind of most fearful instincts. I do think the Machiavellian version of liberty is, is dangerous. It's inherently dangerous because it plays upon our fears. Uh, and the civil rights version of liberty, of course, I embrace strongly, along, you know, the comments that Louise made about multiculturalism. That's been the, the progress that we've made as a country has, has really been largely connected to our openness to more liberty, more freedom, not less and not simply trying to uh, protect the liberty that we have. So I think that's our future is to fight for that and not to, uh, to fight to contain the forces of darkness around us and, and protect our liberty against others' liberty. All righty, thank you so much. You know, we're out of time. Uh, one thing in this discussion is, is shown to me is that these issues are not independent of each other, so they certainly are intertwined. And I think through this discussion, our audience has seen that, that they're intertwined. Um, my last thought is about this discussion is that after 245 years of trying to make a more perfect union, um, trying to break down our tribal boundaries is key and paramount to finding that more perfect union. So I'd like to thank our guests for today, John Wyhey, Neil Milner, Luis Ng, Rupmani Kanadar, and John Davidan. I'd also like to thank HPU for sponsorship of this program. I think it's something that we might look at again in the future to do again, because we certainly just didn't have enough time. And I apologize to all those that uh, submitted questions, but we weren't able to get at them. So maybe next time. Uh, thank you for joining us for Think Tech Hawaii, and we hope to see you again in the future. I'm Tim Apicella, your moderator, and we'll see you again. Aloha.